good evening uh, shall i uh, share my screen yes please <clears throat> Good evening, everybody, um, and uh, welcome back. I'm extremely delighted to um, inform you that we have uh, one of the pioneers of uh, patellar femoral joint surgery with us today uh, to talk on patellar instability. Uh, Dr. John Fulkerson does not need an introduction in the patellar femoral joint world, um, and uh, we're extremely lucky to have him here um, and to learn from him. Uh, it's a rather difficult topic. Uh, uh, which has daunted knee surgeons over the years. And it's an honor for me to introduce Professor Fulkerson to, to you. Um, he currently serves as a professor of orthopedic surgery at uh, Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut. And he did his MD at Yale University with honors in 1972 and served in the government service in the US up to 75. And he had been in full-time faculty of University of Connecticut up to 1995. Uh, he has served as a sports team physician for the Trinity College, NHL Whalers, US Olympic ice hockey team, and AHL Watford Wolfpack. Uh, he has been in the board of directors and executive committees, committees of the following journals and associations. Uh, among the journals, he served as an editor for uh, Sports Medicine Update. Of, this is a journal of AOASSM. And as associate editor of Arthroscopy, and Board of Trustees of Arthroscopy and is a member of IKDC committee. And among associations, he's been associated with uh, uh, AANA, which is Arthroscopy Association of North America in various capacities for six years as a secretary, master instructor, and uh, as chairman of research committee. He was associated with AOSSM um, as a chairman of the publication committee. Uh, with AAOS, he was in the program committee of sports medicine section for ISA course, he was in the knee committee and he served as a president of Herodica Society and the Greater Hartford Research Foundation. And more importantly, he was the president and founder of the Patellofemoral Foundation. Uh, he founded the following sports medicine program at, and fellowship at University of Connecticut, founding board of Orthopedic Learning Center in Chicago, International Patellofemoral Study Group and the Patellofemoral Foundation Isakos Patellofemoral Traveling Fellowship, and he's given over 250 lectures worldwide and published over 100 peer reviewed scientific articles and chapters. And he's received uh, the following awards Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medal, Bantam Award from Trinity College, Honorary President, Turkish Arthroscopy Association, Lifetime Achievement Award, San Francisco based Knee Society, and uh, Best Doctors, US News and World Report and Patellofemoral Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award uh, 2019. He's also a good player of tennis, having received a doubles champion title at New Haven Lawn Club and men's and mixed doubles champion title at Litchfield, Connecticut. He has patented the true pull uh, patellofemoral brace and has written the disorders of patellofemoral joint book in 2004 and monograph in 2005. And his major contributions in orthopedics uh, include he created and popularized anteromedial uh, tibial tubercle transfer for relief of patellofemoral pain related to lateral patellar tracking and uh, articular breakdown. Identified nerve injury in the patellar retinacular support as a cause of knee pain in 1985 and first described the quadriceps pretendon graft for ACL reconstruction in 1998 and described medial quadriceps tendon femoral ligament reconstruction for patellar instability in 2016. And his uh, current areas of special interest include trochlear dysplasia, causes of patellofemoral pain, optimization of patellar stabilization surgery, and outcome of uh, patellar stabilization surgery. We welcome you, uh, Professor Fulkerson. Thank you very much for accepting our invite. Uh, we have uh, in the panel, um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bobby Anand, uh, he has been with us before twice. Uh, as you know, he's a specialist knee surgeon based at uh, Surgery, uh, so, sorry, Surrey and London uh, in the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, he's the Joint Director of Surgery at Swilliot, which is the biggest joint replacement center in the UK and treats many uh, high profile professional athletes uh, from the sporting world, including footballers, hockey players and martial arts experts. He's also a leading, uh, 
is leading the robotic uh, knee surgery in the local area. And his research uh, interests include ACL, MCL, return to sports and patella instability. And he has served in uh, numerous international committees over the last six years and currently serves on the sports knee committee of SICOR. Uh, welcome, uh, Bobby and uh, Professor Fulkasan. Thank you very much. Um, you, you can. Uh, I would invite uh, Professor Fulkasan to start his uh, talk now. Okay. So, um, can you see that? Okay. Um, that Srinivas, you need to unshare. Oh, okay. Sorry. Welcome, Dr. Fulkerson. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. It's a great pleasure for us. But, and, thank you very much. Yeah, this is great honor. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and, it's really nice to be able to be with you this way. Um, the comfort of my own home here. Uh, and uh, so I'm grateful to be able to talk about my favorite subject. Thank you for that overwhelming introduction. I, I didn't think you were going to read my whole CV, but anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, this uh, is an important topic, and I think i just start out by saying that, <clears throat> you know, I think we've come a long, long way in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the level of understanding from when I started, uh, when I graduated from uh, my residency in 1978 until now is, is really staggering. I think we really can take much better care of patients. So this is a summary slide at the beginning, really, just to give some orientation to um, the younger um, orthopedic surgeons uh, who may not be uh, involved with this type of surgery as much, but <clears throat> I think these are really sort of principles, and then we'll go through the whole thing. Um, so. The idea, when do you move a tibial tubercle? Uh, I think you're probably all familiar with that. Um, basically, <clears throat> the idea is it's a way to, to gain balance of the extensor mechanism. So that really, and the ability to unload articular lesions. Um, it's a very powerful way to modify forces around the patellofemoral joint. If you just need to get the alignment better, you can move the tubercle medial if you want to unload, the, particularly the distal part of the patella, you can raise up the distal end by doing an anteromedial tibial tubercle transfer. So I, the, I hasten to add all these procedures, contrary to the way it was in the 1980s, these are sort of used, believe it or not, interchangeably. Some surgeons always did tubercle transfers for patella instability. Other surgeons always did medial imbrications. We now know that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and it created some problems for people. So. This is part of customizing the surgery. I think that's the best way to look at it. So every part of what you do should have a specific intent. If the patella is too high, you may need to bring it down, but it's, it's a slightly dangerous procedure to do because it does cause increased load, particularly in flexion, as we're finding out with some pretty um, uh, early research uh, from Jason Coe. Uh, so we really have to be careful with these, and you'll see more about that. Trochleoplasty, uh, you sure have probably heard about, it's very popular, uh, particularly in Germany. Um, we, uh, in the US, for the most part, um, really are not big fans of trochleoplasty. It's an intra-articular procedure. It creates stiffness, unknown long-term consequences, and it really does affect the articular cartilage. And now we're starting to find, I'll show you a little bit about this, that actually, Trochoplasty surgeons have a concept that they're making the joint more congruous. What we're finding is they're actually making the joint less congruous because there is a track for the patella. You have a dysplastic patella on a dysplastic trochlea. So let's mention a little bit more about that. And then once you have balanced tracking for patella instability treatment surgically, then you need to add back the uh, structure medially that supports the patella, uh, the medial uh, patellofemoral complex. We'll talk more about that. So the idea here, as you see in the big picture over here on the right big slide is optimize alignment, unload articular lesions, and restore retinacular supports. If you don't remember anything else about my talk, please uh, just remember that because I think that summarizes what we as surgeons can do for people. Um, 
And if we think carefully about each patient, uh, we, can, we can really do a good job uh, customized for each person. So again, now the rest of this will be repeat just to uh, go into detail. Tibial tubercle transfer <clears throat> is the best way to get a patella aligned with the trochlea. And we're finding out more and more, it also is a way to get the patella to the trochlea sooner in early flexion. And that's something I wouldn't have said a year ago, but some of the research we're doing now. So I'll say it again, because I think you'll see increasingly over the next few years, this is really, really cutting edge to the point that it's not even really published. What we're doing with the tibial tubercle transfer is to get the patella to the trochlea a little bit sooner in gait, so it can engage with the trochlea early in the flexion arc, okay? I think it's a very salient uh, point and it'll be very helpful if you think about it that way. Um, so when we move the tubercle medially, what we're doing is getting the patella to the trochlea a little bit sooner so it can engage as the trochlea deepens further into flexion. Um, and anteromedial tibial tubercle transfer is an oblique osteotomy, as you see on the lower right. And what that does is, is it lifts up the patella a little. So if you have an articular lesion, you can lift the patella off of that lesion. So that it becomes a very powerful tool for us in, in optimizing surgery. So this is a pretty recent study um, out of Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Um, they just seem to have incredible numbers of patients. And uh, so this is a group of people that's very interesting. Uh, this was a pretty bold study, I think. Uh, they did 121 MPFL reconstructions in people with trochlea dysplasia. B, C, and D, if you know that de jure classification, those are all the worst, basically, uh, more serious trochlea dysplasias. The pre op Kujala score was 55, which is not too good. Post dot 90. That's a big increase, 94% return to sport at a year. So this is a pretty short-term study, but it does show that at least in the short term, we can make people stable with a medial reconstruction. It is important to note though, that these, they eliminated all those patients that I just showed you in the previous slides who needed to have a tubercle transfer. So people with trochlear dysplasia, but also people who were aligned preoperatively, they had trochlear dysplasia. They didn't have an alignment problem, okay? And the reason I make a big deal about that is because if they have an alignment problem, they're not gonna do well with an isolated medial reconstruction. So that's where I'm just circling back on the whole tubercle transfer concept to use that to stabilize. And again, everybody's at different levels. I know uh, where they are in this kind of thing, but. This is what we're talking about here. This is the osteotomy. It always needs to taper distally down here. That's important if you see my little marking finger here. Uh, and that's so that you don't create a stress riser at the tip. That's probably, you know, that's an important point. And, and look at this lower picture here. You'll see, see how it tapers distally, but you have a lot of bone up here, okay? Important concept. So you have plenty of bone for contact up here but you're tapering it here so that when you move it over, it's a nice, easy transition. There's no stress riser distally. You make a nice flat cut, then you're gonna have a really, really nice osteotomy that's gonna heal very quickly because it's flat. And uh, typically, you know, this is a really pretty benign surgery. I, I, I do a lot of these and uh, do them on an outpatient basis and people do very well, you know, with the right um, criteria. Complications are very, very uncommon. Um, so the AMZ, what we call the interomedialization tibial tubercle osteotomy, AMZ TTO reduces risk of postoperative um, increase of patellofemoral uh, contact pressure versus medialization alone. So that's this anteriorization basically optimizes loading as well as alignment, which is why we tend to do these. Um, and in 2019, uh, you may know. Seth Sherman's name. Uh, he's been very productive here. Um, he's at Stanford University. Tibial tubercle transfer to balance alignment adds no risk to the medial reconstruction. So that's kind of what we thought anyway, but he, he showed that. So then we did an informal poll of experienced patellofemoral surgeons from 
uh, the International Patella Study Group. And we asked, how often do you do a, a TTO, AMZ TTO in primary patellofemoral stabilization surgery? So these are presumably people who need to be aligned. And there, it was quite a range from 20 to 70%. Those are different surgeons, different, probably some were more referral, some are less referral, however it might be. Um, I guess the truth must be somewhere in the middle. Um, but, you know, in my own experience, I get a fair number of people referred for these. Um, so I think my percentages actually might be a little on the higher side uh, than, you know, people in practice. But I've, mine is 30 to 40 percent concomitant cartilage lesion and or objective maltracking uh, in which we would, I would add an anterior medialization. So you can see that there are a lot of people with instability who can be treated with just a medial reconstruction. I think that's a good take home. Definitely don't have to move the tubercle all the time. And when, when we decide to move, we should have a good reason uh, to do it. Revision surgery is a different story. You know, people that had failed MPFL, probably w one main reason there is that, you know, somebody used an MPFL and they didn't correct the alignment. So you can see the close working relationship alignment stabilization. You know, if we're always thinking, how do we optimize the alignment, then do the stabilization. So this is a, a patient who came to my office, uh, <clears throat> it was a while ago now, uh, 29 years after an AMZ. Um, and um, the, um, let me see, on, the, on your right, the, uh, that knee had the anterior medialization. The knee on the left, which was presumably was somewhat of a mirror image, did not have the anterior medialization. I don't know why the other person didn't get the other one corrected, but as you know, some people live with these things, probably uh, had children, got busy, whatever. But it gave us an opportunity to get a window into what happens when you correct alignment and you balance the tracking versus living with the alignment problem and the increased focal load on the lateral patella over time that's uncorrected. It's pretty dramatic. This particular patient is very dramatic. Um, so it shows that if we get the alignment improved early, particularly at the time of doing a stabilization procedure, I think you give them a, uh, we know that you have to give that person a better knee for the rest of their life and cut down the risk that they're going to need an arthroplasty later. So it's a big deal. Take a 17 year old kid. It doesn't seem like a big deal. The patella is over a little bit. If you leave it there when that patient person is 60 years old, they may be looking for an arthroplasty. And I think we can prevent that. In fact, I know we can prevent that. And this is why, this is a study we did back in the 1990s. After doing, this was a cadaver study. In those days we used Fujifilm. We didn't have a uh, tech scan like we have today, but um, these are the loads, the way this was set up um, in the uh, cadaver lab. And then we did the AMZ with a 14.8 millimeters anteriorization. And you can see a dramatic drop in this lower graph in the loads in early flexion. So this is a key. So what you're doing is you're enabling that patella to get into the trochlea sooner. Remember, as I mentioned, the tubercle transfer gets the patella to the trochlea sooner uh, in the flexion arc, <clears throat> makes them more stable for that reason. But it also optimizes the load because it gets the articular loading balanced into the deeper trochlea sooner. <clears throat> so the majority of patients with chronic lateral tracking have intact medial patellofemoral cartilage and do well with an AMZ uh, TTO. So we take this patient. Now this is way down the road. Um, I would refer very few patients for patellofemoral arthroplasty because most of them have patellofemoral arthritis in their 40s have this picture that you see here because they've been left over there as they were aging. And now what I found, because I do a lot of these, is by moving the tubercle into immediately, there's almost always good cartilage immediately. So I move them onto that cartilage and they're good to go. We wrote one paper in patients only over the age of 50 and the results are very good. So my own bias is that I think we can do an anterior medialization on a lot of people with patellofemoral arthritis because this is the pattern you see and get them onto good cartilage immediately and avoid an arthroplasty. So a little bit about distalization. Um, 
again, it's not an interchangeable kind of thing. It's something that we do very specifically for uh, situations in which the patella really is too high and needs to come down. And, and again, like the medial tubercle transfers to get the patella into the trochlea a little sooner. Um, but this is a different concept by bringing it down into the trochlea. The problem with this is, and I'm in a situation where I see complications of some of these things. This is a patient, I've actually had two patients with broken hardware. I've not seen this in, a, in an anterior medial or medial tubercle transfer. I've never seen this in the, my whole very long career at this point. Um, two patients with broken hardware. So it shows the forces when you pull that extensor mechanism distally. It's an enormous change in the loading. You take that whole thing and take that huge quadriceps tendon and pull it out a little bit. And if you remember Blix curve, you're changing the Blix curve and um, just the loads are huge. And we know now that in flexion, um, the load, there's a jump in the loading on the patellofemoral joint. So distalization has some inherent dangers. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't do them, but I think we need to do these very judiciously and change the rehab and you know go a little slower into flexion. Probably don't want to get them fully flexed until they're eight to 10 weeks out after distalizing. It's a little different than with the other procedures. And you can see what happens if, if it's overdone. These pictures on the right, sad situation. This is a 21 year old girl who really ended up with a bad knee. Surgeon had very good intentions, but he just, he overdid it a little bit too much. And, you know, it just unfortunately really had consequences for this young woman. Um, <clears throat> okay, next uh, step, just to hopefully enrich your knowledge of uh, this topic is, uh, you know, in the past, <clears throat> for those of you who've been doing this for a while, we used to do a lot of medial imbrications when the medial structures are stretched out. And it's still something that we can do. It's, it's not a bad thing to do as long as we know we're actually imbricating something because sometimes this whole complex gets so stretched out, you can tighten it up here by the patella, but if this is completely detached down here, you're not really gaining anything. So just kind of think about that as far as imbrications, which is why we don't do many imbrications now. Um, and one of the reasons is we know these reconstructions, the MPFL, and in my case, the MQTFL reconstruction, these work really well. And uh, so we would rather um, hedge our bets and put a graph so we know what, what we've got. So this is a topic I've been very interested in, is this whole anatomy here. Miho Tanaka, uh, Baldwin, uh, Mochizuki in Japan, uh, Bettina Hinkle, uh, there are a number of uh, great uh, surgeons that have really been looking closely. Robert Smigilski in Poland, you know, incredible anatomy on all this stuff. So this is a section we did looking at the inside. You have to take the whole, if you have access to cadaver knees, you flip the whole extensor mechanism upside down and look at the anatomy from the inside. It's really, really interesting, particularly if you have residents and fellows and people in training um, you get a whole different perspective. So for about 10 years, we used to go to every meeting, we'd see a big thing that looked like an Achilles tendon going in every meeting, talk about the MPFL, this big structure. It's an idea that we created in our heads. Not There is an M medial patellofemoral component to the medial complex, but the anatomy here is complicated. And the truth is a lot of the structural support for the extensor mechanism goes right into the extensor mechanism right up in here. And so you can see the darkened fibers. This is what I refer to as the MQTFL because it doesn't go to the patella. It's a medial quadriceps tendon femoral ligament. And that's important. There are components here too. In this particular knee, this was very dominant into the extensor mechanism, but there's variability. And if you look from the outside, uh, it's really a uh, wonderful anatomy to do take some perseverance because it's easy to cut through these fibers that are actually very, very thin. But if you look from the outside, here's the adductor magnus tendon on the medial side, the adductor tubercle, the medial epicondyle, the medial collateral ligament. So if you look at this, look at this complex. This is really, this is it. This is a support for the, media, for the patella. A lot of these fibers interdigitate with the vastus medialis tendon here. And if you look at the direction, here's the top of the patella. And you can see here are MQTFL fibers going up here. And you'll see why that's important. At least I think it's important. 
And you can see, look at this here. This is, uh, it shows how this comes right up into the quadriceps tendon. And actually in this particular knee, you don't even really see much going towards the patella. So it's really sort of fascinating. And uh, you can see that here. What you can see here too is how these fibers intersect with the medialis, quadriceps medialis tendon fibers. These are all closely in, so it's all, these are all attached to each other in here. This is not one big band that comes up like that independent of everything else. It's all part of one mechanism. This is one big complex medial, what we call medial patellofemoral complex. And so what we're doing is just reconstructing this component, which clearly has an intentional origin here. That would be where the adductor tubercle is. You can see there are fibers that go down there. So that's important, that part of it. That's what kind of anchors this whole thing into the medial side. And it's one reason why medial imbrications may not quite do it, because if you tear this and you imbricate that, you're not really getting what you want. So that's why we think putting a tendon graft is usually a good idea. So this gives you another idea of just how intricate this anatomy is. This, uh, this is Robert Smigilski. As far as I'm concerned, he is the master uh, anatomist, orthopedic surgeon, but um, he dissected out all these fibers. And until you have tried to dissect this, I can tell you from personal experience in probably, probably 35, 40 knees that I've personally been involved in dissecting, this is, you know, this is an unbelievable uh, thing because these fibers are so thin. I, it still amazes me that he was able to do this. I mean, I, there's one little, there might be one little pinhole right here, but other, <laughs> maybe over here, but to dissect that out like that is an incredible feat. Okay, so here, here is the, uh, the more proximal part of what we call the medial patellofemoral complex. So bear in mind, those of you who are going to meetings 10, 15 years ago, you'd see a cord going from here, actually from here to here, okay? Because that would be the medial uh, epicondyle adductor tubercle region, here to here. Well, you can see, yes, there are some fibers that go up that way, um, but there are also fibers that go up here. I prefer this portion here because this is a good stable MQTFL. And there's some interest in the patellotibial part. So I don't really know what the um, relationship of that is. But uh, I asked McGilski, how long did it take you to dissect that out? He said, uh, about a week. <laughs> so it's just interesting what people do. But it's a real contribution. Um, perseverance. So here it is. These are me, some of Miho Tanaka's dissections. She defined in 2016 Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery what, what we refer to as Tanaka's point. I sort of tease her with that a little bit, but you know, she really did define this because this is what she calls, she defined the midpoint of the medial patellofemoral complex. So really that's what we reconstruct. Most typically, I think most surgeons these days will direct the MPFL reconstruction to this area. So they're really going to the midpoint of the patellofemoral complex. Interesting thing is you can put a graft here and you can put it into the patella here, or you can bring it through the VMO tendon and anchor it to the quadriceps tendon, which is what I prefer to do, and end up at the same point. So medial quadriceps tendon femoral ligament reconstruction doesn't go like that. Oh, you could go like that. It should still work because there's a component, but the goal is actually to get it to the midpoint. So if, if you're following what I'm saying, I'll go through that again. Show this anatomy again, because this is your secret to doing this surgery accurately every time. We don't use radiographic criteria. We use the adductor tendon. Make the incision as big as you need to medially, because this is critically important for the patient. Find the adductor magnus tendon, which is, you know, it's a clear linear structure. Take as long as you need to find it. Follow it down to the adductor tubercle. Make your drill hole right there. And then you can have a graph going right up here where you want that. That's how, that's how I like to do it. And then if you make the decision a little longer, you can see this if you want extra security as to where you are. But we're wary of the uh, radiographic criteria. Um, and I'll show you why. Femoral fixation must be correct. I mean, this is just like an ACL. We don't want an ACL that's off two or three millimeters or heaven forbid a centimeter, but the, radio, the problem is with radiographic criteria, they can be absolutely right or they can be absolutely wrong. And um, so for me, I want to see the anatomy. And uh, so I have a series of these. I had one a couple of weeks ago. Again, 
The one I had recently actually had two, an initial and a revision M PFL reconstruction, and they were both in the wrong place. Uh, so she had two failed medial reconstructions. We took a post-op uh, radiograph. I'll put it in this talk for the next time I give it. And we showed that where we put it anatomically was so far away from these other ones. It, it, it's amazing. I mean, once you know this anatomy, you'll know that that's off. And so what happens when, and that's way proximal. This is way up. We know that it should be down here. So this happens. Um, and unfortunately, it leads to a lot of problems and it leads to cartilage overload and failure and misery, recurrent instability. It's because the surgery is not done well. Here's one that just yanked, pulled out all the anchors. Cause you can see right here, this is a person that has an alignment issue. They didn't, they didn't improve the alignment before they did this. If they'd done a tibial tubercle transfer, probably would have done all right, assuming that these were anatomic. But you can do an anatomic reconstruction in a knee that's still tracking laterally and it's still gonna fail. So these are all the little tips that will uh, make your patients happy. So these rules of thumb, all reconstructions must be anatomically accurate, make the incisions as large as possible to assure full understanding of the anatomy. That's the key. See, know the anatomy, study it before you do the surgery. It's easy anatomy to define once you know it. And then the adductor tendon is really the guide to success. Just a quick little video here, just to show how that looks at surgery. Once you're in there immediately, you can see there's the adductor tubercle. Right here, the key structure. There it is, it's a nice glistening white tendon. tendon. So I've taken a little bit of time here, and that's really the key to success in this surgery, to doing an anatomic reconstruction, is finding the adductor magnus tendon. So this is what it looks like after Find that point right at the distal end of the adductor tubercle. We drill a hole right there. Anatomic 100% of the time because we saw the anatomy. It's easier to see this anatomy than for an ACL because it's right in front of you. You can see it right there. So they end up with a little bigger incision, but they end up with an anatomic reconstruction. I'll take the incision any day. So this is a little study we did. Try looking at all these things. Um, and what we did is we put in the pin for uh, the MPFL or MQTFL reconstruction by radiographic criteria on uh, a series of knees. I think it was only eight, eight knees. It was a small number of knees. And uh, what we found is an average of eight millimeters uh, off from what we felt was the correct anatomic site. And this was with taking time to do the radiographs as well as we could in an OR setting. And so that was, that's what we found is that, uh, you know, it's just not as accurate as we would think the radiographic. And Sanchez Alfonso, if you know him, he's a very, very uh, academic guy in Spain, Valencia, Spain, uh, has done a lot of work on all this. He says, none of the standard radiographic methods allow precise anatomic femoral placement. Conventional radiographic identification, femoral placement is only an approximation should not be used for sole basis. So it's fine to use them, but our feeling is uh, go the extra mile, takes another five, 10 minutes, make the incision and know where you are. So here it is, graft secure to the femoral side of the anchor, posterior to the graft, you can see the adductor tendon. And then what I like to do is bring it up under the VMO, again, headed for that midpoint of the patellofemoral complex. So it's coming under the VMO at the proximal patella and then anchoring it into the quadriceps tendon. So that one way that looks. Here's a fresh anatomic specimen. You can see Sheba Joseph uh, did these. She uh, actually is a master's degree in anatomy. Uh, fortunately, she was one of our fellows, so she's a really you know masterful anatomist. Here's the adductor tendon, and um, right into the adductor uh, tubercle, and. You can see here, it's the medial patellofemoral complex. So this is the point we're aiming for right here. And then <clears throat> medial side of the knee. So you can see that. So there's the drill hole in this anatomic specimen. See the adductor tendon right there into the adductor tubercle. There's a hole, 100%. Then we fixed our tendon graft there. You can see the medial epicondyle right here below the, below. And that's how the graft looks. Put it right there, 
and the common. Now this is a, it's not tricky really, really but um, this is a part of it. How do you fix up there? Well, we bring it through the VMO. Here's the top of the patella up here. You can see it's below the top of the patella, right at that, what we call Tanaka's point, midpoint. So then pull it up underneath there and then make another incision in the quadriceps tendon more centrally and put the hemostat in the same incision that the graft comes out of like this. So it goes up there like that. Okay, that's, that's a key point because what that does is that enables you, you'll go, okay, it comes up here, then we put the hemostat up here and then pull it underneath like that. And then you can lock this down and use this to additionally secure your tendon graft here and then suture this together. And as you can see, that's gonna bring that right to that midpoint of the patellofemoral complex. No drill holes in the patella, no risk of patella fracture, which is a known uh, risk factor of uh, MPFL reconstructions, anatomically correct. And the best part is you can cycle this. You can actually cycle that now that you've got that placed up through the second incision anteriorly, and you can bring the graft out to length. You can look at the isometry and evaluate it because once it's fixed at the femur, you're bending the knee and you can see if it's pistoning in there, it shouldn't. If you're anatomically correct, the amount of movement of that graft will be minimum. Whatever the movement is, which should be absolutely minimum to nothing, if you're anatomically correct, suture it at the longest point, wherever it pulls out to the longest, because what you really don't want to do is make it too tight. That's the other thing that can happen with these. You make it a little too tight or you try to pull the patella and that's when people start getting into trouble and then people have tightness. And I've had to cut several grafts that were actually looked very good. They looked like they were placed well on the femur, but they made it too tight and the patient was miserable. So we had to cut it and revise it. Um, so just a rule of thumb, you know, it's better, better a little loose than too tight. Think about it this way. If you get the alignment right, the extension mechanism is balanced. You don't have to be pulling on that. You can just let that sit right there. Some people say give it one, um, one uh, quartile of uh, motion by pushing it a little bit laterally and just you know a little bit of laxity there is not a bad thing. But above all, don't make it too tight. Anatomically accurate. One quadrant of lateral translation to avoid over constraint. So this is some early data. We actually have a, a bigger series that we keep working on. We haven't actually published it yet, but it's pretty consistent with these and the satisfaction actually is very similar to this. High level satisfaction, a lot of people turning to sports. I mean, this is very high return to sport. These hold up incredibly well. If they're done well, if you get the balance of the extensor mechanism and you get the tensioning right with the MQTFL, people do, really very, very well and with very low morbidity. You gotta get all those little things right. Then we rest them in a splint and then we start one flexion arc a day of motion. Remember this graft is very anatomic, so you don't really have to worry about anything pulling apart, particularly if you've balanced the extension mechanism. There's really virtually very minimal stress in this. And then once you sutured it and anchored it, and you've got a little you know, slight play in there, you can have them bend their knee, it's not a problem. You want them to bend their knee as much as possible so they don't get stiff. <clears throat> and then uh, we start regular physical therapy, uh, five to six weeks. So this is why we do the MQTFL reconstruction. This is well reported, particularly Shital Parikh, one of your countrymen. Shital is a wonderful, uh, do you know Shital? Yeah, Shital just wrote a book, a great book on the patellofemoral joint. He's a real leader. Um, and um, have great, great respect for Shital. Anyway, he wrote this up about uh, fractures. Uh, I had a series of six, I think, that he had come to his practice. So it's a big deal, you know, making that drill hole in the patella. There's a little bit about trochleoplasty. I uh, hope I'm not going too long. I'm almost done. Um, Ruin A 2015 showed that 33 out of 34 developed arthritis. We, it's really, really rare for, for me to do a trochleoplasty. I might take off the bump a little bit. Sometimes if it's getting in the way, do a little recession approximately. Um, here are some pictures that were sent to me by um, one surgeon who does quite a few trochleoplasties. But you can see here, when you look at these pictures, you know, this is not, it doesn't make the joint normal. And you can see the late arthritis. Um, and so at one level, you say, well, how can it not cause arthritis? You know, because it's a pretty profound effect on the particular cartilage. 
And here's the thing I'm actually working on now. This is my current research, um, actually right now on a study break uh, and looking at this. So we've got these 3D prints of knees. So look at how the patella courses. This is your J sign here. This is a trochlea. So patella starts out over here, right? Super patella, super trochlea rather. And then look at how it goes. Here's how it watches. I hope you can see this little arrow. Here's a patella, how it tracks. It's not going from proximal to distal. Look how far medially that has to go. And then it has to go around, it's an arc. I mean, I think this realization will really help you. And one of the reasons is, you know, the patella is not coming like this over that bump. You know, that's how we have perceived this. Like, oh, you gotta get rid of the bump, you know, go in here, take out all this bone and, you know, push that down. Well, there may be some logic to bringing it down a little bit, but in actual fact, the more I look at these, these patellae that I can see from where I'm sitting right now, the patella actually comes into this groove. It's congruous. This is its groove. Its groove is not up here. Okay, if you see, see what I mean. So actually it's, it's kind of elegant how well that patella, even though it's just plastic, is tracking in that groove, just like that, going around that curve. So what we are actually thinking more and more now is by doing the tubercle transfer, we're getting the patella to this groove a little earlier. It's not a matter of making it more congruous. Doing a trochlear plastic makes it less congruous. What we're really goal is to get it there, get it into the groove as it deepens further in deflection. If you see, see my drift on that. And when you do a trochlear plastic, what you're doing is you're changing this slope. And this slope is actually probably exactly what it should be for the patella at that point. If you see what I mean, a patella gets to this point, it's congruous with that. So if you do a trochleoplasty, now you've created a steeper uh, wall on the lateral side, if you will. You've taken this out. And so the patella doesn't have its medial portion of its groove anymore. It's just a different way to look at it. So, you know, it's a pretty profound thing to do, to start our altering this articular cartilage. That's all I'm saying. So will trochleoplasty lengthen or shorten the time to patella femur or arthroplasty? in patella instability surgery. And, and my guess right now is based on everything I can see, it probably shortens the time to patella femoral arthroplasty doing a trochlearplasty. One last thing here, the RIP score, take a look at this uh, without getting into a lot of detail, but basically these are the criteria, the age of the patient, the first dislocation, these are primary dislocators. How much trochlear dysplasia, how much their TTTG is elevated, and their skeletal immaturity. Those are the four factors now, the RIP, Havesi RIP score, which we look at. And uh, you may have some similar research in your country, but we're now uh, getting a better idea who needs surgery earlier to uh, prevent future problems. So thank you for bearing with me uh, and uh, happy to take any questions or whatever you like to do. Take a look at the Patellofemoral Foundation. There's a lot of educational material there if uh, anybody's interested. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fulkerson. Uh, could you uh, stop sharing the screen, please? Thank you very much, Professor Fulkerson. That was a, uh, an excellent presentation. It answered lots of uh, queries we had with lots of tips and uh, pearls on uh, doing a tibial um, tubercle transfer and MQTFL reconstruction. Um, just ask a couple of questions and then hand over to Bobby for his comments and questions, and then we'll take some questions from the viewers also, if that's okay. Um, Professor Fulkerson, how do you manage pediatric uh, patellofemoral instability with open physis? Um, so uh, yeah. what is your uh, algorithm for managing those cases, as well as an unreduced uh, patellar dislocation? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> For me, uh, pediatric stabilization is, is pretty straightforward because I like soft tissue uh, fixation. I like the adductor tubercle. And so I suture the graft into the adductor tendon insertion into the adductor tubercle. And then I suture it into the quadriceps tendon. So I don't make any drill holes so I don't have to worry about the physis. And did you say an unreduced patella dislocation? Yes, and you, uh, you don't do any, you cannot do any distal work on the pediatric patients. Okay. So not unreduced in, in a child. Yeah, so that would, 
be more likely in um, someone with cerebral palsy, perhaps? Is that the kind of thing you're referring to? That, yeah, those are, those are very tough. I mean, <clears throat> if it's unreduced and skeletal immature, it's a real problem. I, I would tend to wait until skeletal maturity. Um, I'm pretty aggressive with tubercle transfers. I've had some really, I've had people who are 30 years old, one guy in particular comes to mind, a bilateral fixed lateral habitual dislocation was both patellas and had, had a really great result uh, ultimately after doing a very aggressive tubercle transfer, a very large lateral release, bringing the extension mechanism up on top and stabilizing it immediately. Took a pretty major tubercle transfer, compensatory uh, transfer, but uh, he actually did very well. He had one done, he came back the following year, got his other knee done. and. So I, I would wait in a child until skeletal maturity. I like to get the mechanism balanced. And I'm not sure any soft tissue reconstruction in a skeletal immature kid would do much. Um, sort of a thought on that. How do you manage an unreduced uh, patella dislocation in an open physis? In a, in a child? In a child, yes. Unreduced. So you're, you're talking about somebody who's wheelchair bound. I mean, if they can function, I would probably get try to get them to skeletal maturity and just leave it and then wait until probably age 15 or so and then and then move it. Now, otherwise, I don't know, skeletally uh, immature with a dislocated um, is a big problem. I'm not so sure. I mean, there are procedures like the Galeazzi procedure that people have done. Um, but I don't th personally, I don't think that's probably enough. It, it, I guess one answer would be to do something palliative like that and to put a medial structure in, but I think it would be destined to fail. So it's a tough problem. I don't think there's any easy answer. And this uh, MQD, see what the, so the, the MQDFL reconstruction is an extra capsular procedure, isn't it? it yeah. It, you go under the VMO, you go outside the capsule, but under the VMO. That's correct. Yeah, right under the VMO, extra synovial. And does um, trochlear dysplasia, uh, how does it affect the screw home mechanism of the knee? Do we have uh, um, any information on that, any literature? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not, you're talking about doing a trochleoplasty specifically or, or trochlear dysplasia in general? Trochlear dysplasia in general, uh, how it affects, uh, you know, normal uh, trochlea, no, normal, uh, normally developed uh, distal femur, we, we have the screw home mechanism extend when, when we extend the knee. But uh, in a dysplastic knee, how, I mean, what yeah. changes? I don't know. I really don't know. I've never looked at that specifically. Um, that'd be a good, good topic to pursue. It'd be probably a little difficult to understand, but I think one thing I would say, I think 3D printing would help us to understand. I do have 3D prints, again, right across the room where I'm sitting, um, and just taking a close look at those and trying to correlate that with the screw home mechanism might be helpful. I haven't done that. I'll think about it some now with our 3D models, but I I think that would probably give us a little bit of a window to what might, or at least to what hypothetically might happen. Bobby, do you have any comments, questions? I'll actually yeah. ask. Uh, uh, thank you, Sri. I think you asked a couple of mine anyway. But um, Professor, uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, just a, a few comments and questions. I mean, I, I'm, I have an interest in patellofemoral work. I, I've got reasonable sized tertiary referral practice for it and I've been doing it for about seven years so I'm at the beginning of my I suppose my my journey and um, Europe I, I think there is a, a divergence in terms of the, the practice in Europe and the states perhaps I mean I, I do a fair amount of trochleoplasty work I mean I, I just uh, I was just looking at my three-year data and um, I've done about 120 patellofemoral procedures over that time and 18 to 20 percent are bony and um, most of the bony are actually trochleoplasty interestingly they're you know, just just looking at it um, and yeah I, I understood uh, I appreciate all the, the uh, what you've described why do you think there is that divergence I mean 
Germany's obviously a big centre. France is a big centre. UK, uh, we've got three or four of us who do quite good numbers. It's a, it's a tricky operation, but my personal data is is, is very compelling. Um, but I have to say, you know, that, that paper you quoted on um, 94% return to sport with the MPFL, I, I, I wouldn't have that population at all. I mean, most of my patellar instability population are not particularly sporty. I mean, they are... <clears throat> majority of females um they've you know they've been perhaps neglected for many many years and then they by the, by the time they present they're they're in their 20s um and they've often given up sport by that period um so really it was just a comment on what you think is is the population different that we're seeing that you, you know you see a much sportier population for this problem um uh, just trying to get an understanding of why you think there's this divergence yeah no i mean that's, that's a great question i'm glad you asked that um the International Patella Study Group probably would be a very good example. Uh, David DeJour and Philip Schodel are both uh, members of that group. Uh, Philip Schodel in particular and David have really uh, promoted trochleoplasty with, as you know, DeJour's father uh, developed a classification. They're very involved with trochlea dysplasia. And I think based on two-dimensional imaging and uh, what we have known uh, up until the last few years, uh, it's a, it seemed like a logical procedure. And, and then you look at the results and the results are pretty good. People do well. I mean, there are plenty of articles to show that trochleoplasties work. So then you say, well, yeah, so this is a good operation. So they like doing them, like you say, and they have their reasons for doing it and it works. Uh, but then I think what's happened recently is there's increasing data um, and, and more so in the US because we're still looking at it. I think they've already, they kind of consider it a solved problem and we don't. Um, Hospital for Special Surgery has particular data and, and we have data now showing, um, well, first of all, that you know, doing an MPFL reconstruction alone works really well. Um, and of interest is that many of the patients that have trochleoplasties also have MPFL reconstructions done at the same time. So we say, well, if they do well with the MPFL anyway, why do the trochleoplasty, which may have some inherent risks? So our approach is different. And the Patella study group has kind of come full circle. There was a big thrust towards doing trochleoplasties four years ago. Now that the tide has turned in the group and people are starting to look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, that's a pretty profound operation. A lot of us, including myself, are a little bit scared of doing them because it does, you know, have a pretty profound effect. And, um, and, and now we're starting to see that the joint is Congress, you know, we it used to be thought that it was in Congress with trochlear dysplasia. So the, the trend here has been more and more away from trochleoplasty. Like we would say, give us a really good reason to do one and we'll do one, but that doesn't turn out to be very many patients. So I think it's just the way the cycle has gone. I would say, you know, I think it's evolving. I think, I think, I mean, I don't know how Philip Schott will look at it. He's so far into his thinking on it that I don't know if he'll ever turn back, but um, we'll see. I mean, I think we just, we, we believe and, you know, I believe that uh, we can make these people stable. The tubercle transfer actually becomes really our solution many times instead. If we can get the patella to the trochlea and the trochlea is congruous with the dysplastic on both sides, and we feel it's better to just leave them congruous, dysplastically congruous, if you will. So it's just, I don't know, different ways of looking at things, I guess I would say. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's great. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll ask later. You go ahead. Yeah. And Dr. Fulkerson, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, it opened us a lot of uh, concepts regarding uh, patellofemoral joint mechanics. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a, I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, with respect to anteromedialization, how do you decide how much you would like to anteriorize? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the simple answer is the more arthritis, the worse the problem, and the more distal the articular damage, the more you want to anteriorize. So, for instance, if I see a patella that has a lot of articular damage that moves pretty far proximal on the patella, from distal to mid patella, I will want to anteriorize more. So I'll have a trade-off there. I'm going to have less um, 
medialization because the more it goes up, the less you can go medially. So it, it, it largely centers on how much of the problem is arthritis and how much is instability. You have a patient with predominantly instability and you really need the extensor mechanism to be more centralized, then um, you need to go more medial, you know, because that's going to be most important in the instability patient. And if there's a trade-off, it's going to be towards, okay, well, maybe I couldn't move it quite as anterior as I wanted to, but I got a little bit anterior maybe and, you know, help with that part to distract any problems related to that. And then I got it balanced. If it's mostly an arthritic problem and the alignment's not so bad, then more anterior. That's, but I don't think there's a simple formula that's really taking each patient and making a conscious decision about how much to go anterior, how much to go medial. Yeah, yeah, okay, much. And um, do you always do a lateral release of the patellar retinoculum along with your tibial tuberous tree transfer? Um, very good question. Again, uh, most times, yes. I try not to be too aggressive with lateral releases, uh, much less aggressive than we used to be. I do some lateral lengthenings as a hedge um, against medial instability. Uh, to me, the main issue is not being indiscriminate with lateral releases. I think we all, including myself, used to do too many and too much. Now, I'll just release just as much as I need to, mostly distally. If I'm trying to unload a lateral lesion, I want to make sure I take away any tether on the lateral side so that I can lift it up. But I'm not going to go too proximal. I probably wouldn't go, I rarely, if ever, would go above the top of the patella. So then you still have some lateral structure. There's a proximal lateral retinac, which again, uh, intersects with the vastus lateralis tendon. So you still have lateral support. And that's a hedge against uh, medial subluxation. So I think the key is to do only as much as you need to, you know, to allow the patella to lift up. You can look with the scope when you're doing that surgery and make sure you're not leaving a tether that's going to hold it into a, you know, an arthritic area. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, did you ever have to combine uh tibial tuberous tree transfer along with a medial imbrication or a medial supporting procedure? Say it again, do a tubercle transfer with a... Um, with a MPFL or a MQTFL reconstruction. Did you have to combine the tibial tuberous tree transfer with a medial reconstruction? Yeah, that's, that's pretty common. A lot of people, recurrent instability related to... Um, deficiency medially that was caused by an alignment issue that caused the patella to dislocate. So in that surgery, we'll bring the tubercle over, align it, and then um, restore the medial support. So yeah, it's relatively, arthritis is a different story. If it's somebody with a lateral patellofemoral arthritis, then I would rarely do a medial. Uh, those patients don't, typically don't need it. They've already um, broken down the lateral patellofemoral joint and the goal is just to get them medialized, but they rarely need a, a reconstruction on the medial side. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the graft of this for the uh, MQTFL reconstruction? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed part is breaking up a little bit. What is the graft, I'm sorry, what is the graft of your choice for your medial oh. reconstruction? Okay, yeah, we use, uh, I use uh, allograft. Posterior tib allograft. I know that's not always available here. Is that, can you, are you allowed to use allograft in India? We don't use uh, much actually. Allograft no, is we not, don't. We don't. Okay. Use. So, I mean, I would probably use semi tendinosis. If, uh, and, and some people don't want an allograft, I'll use semi tendinosis. You can also turn down a portion of the quadriceps tendon, uh, but you have to be careful with length with that because uh, it's a pretty long distance back to the adductor tubercle and to have. I like to put two centimeters of graft into the socket medially. So I'm a little wary of using quad tendon. I'm not sure you can always get as much length as you'd like to. Just uh, one other question, uh, Professor. Uh, with the, um, when you do your anteromedialization for osteoarthritis, um, with patients who go on to knee replacements, is there any data on outcomes of the knee replacement, if they've had a previous um, anteromedialization, is, is there any difference compared to just doing a primary total knee replacement? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I've, one of my partners used to do some tibial tubercle transfers 
at the time of knee replacements, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I don't do knee replacements. Um, and he felt sometimes he just needed to get the extension mechanism more balanced before doing it. You know, I guess some people would adjust that with the component rotation, right? But, um, but I don't think, oh yeah, I do have a comment on that too. It's just a case just popped into my head of a gentleman who uh, had a really severe alignment issue. Um, I did a tubercle transfer on him. He did really well with it, uh, felt much better got him onto better cartilage for probably eight to 10 years, got older and he had an, a total knee replacement done and they did run into some problems. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a good awareness to have. I th think probably what happened there, you know, and I don't know, I mean, I, when they do the, I, I would say this, I would say there has to be awareness. I think you're raising an important point from the arthroplasty surgeon's perspective that the components have to be adjusted considering where the tubercle has been moved to, if that makes sense, at the time of an arthroplasty. Um, I, I just think it's an awareness that there needs to be with that type of surgery. Thank you. When you fix the, when you suture the, um, the fixation on the quadriceps side, what position of the knee do you keep um, you know, after you do the quadriceps side second after fixing the femoral side. Um, yeah, actually, by the way, um, I don't know if I sent this reference. Uh, Sheba Joseph's, if you look at arthroscopy techniques, which is um, an open access journal, arthroscopy techniques online. Um, if you just put in my name and Sheba Joseph, um, it has a very technique oriented article there that shows some of the same pictures you you saw here but the way i did in terms of flexion i know some surgeons talk about a certain degree of flexion i think it is uh good to flex the knee some to get the patella uh engaged in the trochlea hopefully if the alignment surgery has been done well then it should be nicely centralized so you can confirm that with the scope and then what i would do is just suture it there but before i suture it i cycle the knee completely I mark it with methylene blue and I watch where that line on the graph goes with flexion extension. So what I want is for that, when I suture it to have it at its maximum length. So if it pulls out, if it seems to pull in to that slot where I'm suturing the quad tenon, if it seems to pull in there and it pulls out to a little longer length in flexion, I'll suture it there at that length because I don't want to make it too tight in extension. So um, yeah, yeah, that or too tight in flexion rather. I, I would rather accept a little bit of laxity in the construct, which probably makes sense to you now after hearing the logic of not making it too tight. So it actually becomes very easy. Just cycle it wherever it comes out the length, mark it there, cycle it some more. Very easy to determine that point of maximum length what Jack Farr refers to uh, as um, bringing the graft out to length. And that way you don't have to worry about over constraining it. So it makes it you know, pretty straightforward as far as that's concerned. If your anatomy is way off, you could have problems. If your anatomy is accurate and where you put it on the femoral side, you're not gonna have a problem. Another question is just, just an extension of Sesinda's question actually. Uh, what percentage of your procedures for uh, tibial tubercle transfer uh, and uh, you know isolated tibial tubercle transfers and isolated M MQTFLs uh, tend to have a lateral release? Also, Bobby, what percentage do you do for trochleoplasty? Um, so trochleoplasty, I don't do a lateral release at all. I, I, I don't do lateral releases at all. Natural retinal lengthening, do you do that? No. Okay. So with the surgeries I do, I um, for uh, instability surgery, if they're aligned well, and I'm just doing an MQTFL reconstruction, I don't do a lateral release or a lateral lengthening usually. Um, and if there's a tubercle transfer, then it depends. If they're tight laterally, then I might need to do some, as I mentioned before, but very cautiously. Okay.
Okay, Professor John, we have a lot of questions from the audience. I would like to, I mean, if you're okay, I would like to have a couple of questions answered by you. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, there is uh, Dr. Sharkavi. He asks, how frequently you face a high patella? Um, well, in all of my instability surgeries, I guess the best answer I could give you, uh, which are pretty common, I, I probably do an instability surgery once a week or more. Um, I would say of all those, if, I, if over an average year, I would say there might be, let's say in one year, maybe I do 60. Um, I would say in that group, and I haven't looked at this recently, but I should look at it. Um, probably five to eight would involve some degree of distalization. So I would say probably it's 10 to 15% maybe where I would actually do some, but I'm very cautious with distalization. I don't do very much, but I might do some to get the patella into the choke a little sooner, usually in combination with an anterior medialization or tubercle medialization. Okay. Um, Dr. Vineet asks you, in the 30 to 40% of anteromedialization tibial tuberosity transfer that you do, what are the indications of doing it and not doing it? Uh, I think you have covered this. Yeah, I didn't really talk as much about that. Uh, should have, but you know, if the TTTG is high, if they have lateral tracking, uh, the TTPCL, functionally, if they ride laterally, um, if I'm concerned about the amount of the J sign, it's actually a kind of complicated question, <laughs> but, um, because, you know, I may, the way I'm thinking now, I may want to get the patella to the trochlea a little sooner. Um, and so I may decide to do it on that basis, but usually it's in combination with some of those other factors, alignment factors like the TTTG. We look at the Q angle, although that's not totally reliable. Look at the function. I think you have to look at everything. I don't trust any one measurement. TTTG is not enough for me. It's a, it's a flashing yellow light. I look at the TTTG, if it's 20, I say, oh, well, you know, I better take a look at this and uh, see if it correlates with some of the other things. But I like to see correlations in a picture that point in that direction, say, okay, yeah, you should, I should move that tubercle medially or anterior medially. So I have a good reason to do it. But that's less than 50% for instability, you know, quite a bit. Probably, it's probably roughly a third, one out of three. You know, most, Instability patients, I'm just doing them QTFL. Okay, Professor John, what are the suture material and the size of the suture that you use for for making the reconstruction? I like the uh, softer uh, number two uh, sutures. I, I tend not to use fiber wire because it's coarser. Um, uh, the other one that's coarse, um, let me see. Force fiber is pretty coarse. You know, they, I think they're a little more likely to cause symptoms. They also make a stiffer knot. I think Hi-Fi, which is the ConMed product and um, Ultra Braid, which is a Smith and Nephew product. I've actually looked at the articles because those sutures are right under the skin. I like to have them be, you know, one of the softer uh, high tension um, sutures. And I bury the knots. I try to tie all the knots on the deep side um, so that they're not underneath the skin because people don't like the feeling of having a little knot right under the skin. So there's definitely a technique in doing that to you know, softer sutures. The softer sutures tend to make a more secure knot anyway because they're less likely to unravel. Um, and I'm saying this, I have no particular relationship to any of those companies. So it doesn't have any, I don't have any relationship or you know, full disclosure. So I'm saying that based only on um, the literature, you can look it up and see that different sutures and their characteristics. But I think Hi-Fi and Ultrabrave for me are the, probably the two most reliable and the best knots, at least irritating. Okay, thank you very much. I have one question for Dr. Bobby. Uh, Dr. Bobby, uh, can you tell us something about your specific absolute indications for trochleoplasty? And uh, has uh, uh, had the studies like uh, uh, let's say that the medial patellofemoral reconstruction, even in stage B and C, and sometimes even D, possibly do well 
even with a trophoplasty has it changed your practice and what's your opinion about that personally so um it's a good question uh, going uh, i mean there's the, the issue with the patella femoral uh, well there's, there's there's a lot of conflicting publications so i, I think um uh, john was talking about the distalization and i've definitely reduced the number of distalizations i do as well and i probably do a couple of year of that um and that's partly based on papers that have shown that even doing an isolated MPFL actually potentially creates a little bit of distalization in that in that process. There was a good paper about three or four years ago on that. Um, so, uh, in terms of specifics with regards to trochleoplasty and MPFL, I, I think if you look at most systematic reviews and you look at MPFL satisfaction, it's not brilliant. I mean, it's it's between seventy to eighty percent satisfaction rates. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, the complication rates, there's quite a lot published on it. I, I've published a paper with uh, Professor Kadar on uh, looking at some of that. Um, but essentially, MPFL, if you, if you are indiscriminate and everyone gets an MPFL, I think you're going to get a, a group that do very well. And, and the groups that tend to, to do worse, based upon what literature there is on it, are the more dysplastic patients so i think i think there is enough data on that now um i've i've always done chocolate classes from just my training background um, i was trained by johnson eldridge who did who did a lot of them and um you know I, I reserve it for pretty severe dysplasia so typically du jour type d uh, and these are patients when you examine them as they go through a range of movement you see the kneecap jumping out uh, unfortunately i'm at work so i can't give you some of the videos and uh, I've got a couple of nice videos that we um, presented at the ESCAR Congress of different uh, a J sign and a reverse J sign, quite dramatic ones, and how you'd manage those differently. But you know, if you've got a very significant J sign, and i.e. that you know the patella is jumping over that lateral bump, I personally don't believe that the MPFL will be enough, and so that's where you do need a bony procedure, and the bony procedure you prefer, uh, you know, that's uh, as you see. Uh, Professor has explained that the you know, the antimedialization is the way to go. I I, I tend to prefer the uh, trochleoplasty in that situation, um, and so that's the type of indication I use it for. Um, I do a lateral parapatellar approach to it. I don't do the du jour thick flap. I I tend to do a thin flap, which restricts the patients I can do it in. You need them to be younger, so typically age seventeen to. The oldest I've done was a lawyer. Actually, she was about forty five. And it got tricky at that point because you do start getting a few little cracks. You have to be very careful. But the younger you are, you really, it's, it's not an easy operation. You've just got to be careful not to violate the cartilage at all. Um, and so it generally should be reserved for guys who are doing a bit more than, you know, we, we tend to, you know, in our area, I, I get them uh, in, in other areas. So you, you don't want everyone having a go and doing one or two a year. because It's not an operation that's particularly common. So... Yeah, so in answer to your question, severe dysplasia, I do it as a primary procedure. I have used it as a salvage um, as well in certain cases and it's worked fine. Um, I suppose my big change in practice, and I don't know if it's a good change or, or a change for the worse, but um, when I started, I did pure trochleoplasty with no added operation. And I've looked at that data. We've not had any redislocations in that group. They do feel a bit more mobile, but they've not re-dislocated. They seem quite nicely balanced. And I had a 0% stiffness rate with that group. Um, as soon as I introduced a um, MPFL with the trochleoplasty, which seemed to be the, the sort of trend that was happening, and then I thought, yeah, it'd be nice to just have them have a little bit more constraint. Um, my stiffness rate definitely went up. And it may have been that it's actually quite hard to balance your MPFL when you do a trochleoplasty to get the tension right because you do the MPFL second it's very hard to get that tension right and as loose as you go you might be going a bit too tight so I think I've got better I still have a stiffness rate but it's really come down because my MPFL is just literally you know it's very lax and it's just holding it in place so yeah they're the indications and I now would, re, uh, would do a trochleoplasty with an MPFL uh, in terms of elite athlete group, uh, I've, I can only think of two I've done in the last few years, and, and they're they both soccer football players, and they've they both got back. Um, the vast majority of patients are 
non-athletic. Um, they're not like my typical patients. They're, you know, we have a fair number that are, you know, overweight. They've tended to be a population that have perhaps not had ideal treatment over the years and have been neglected a little bit. Uh, they've had multiple dislocations as a result. Um, you know, they tend not to be very sporty. They've, you know, they've given up sport at a young age. And so just getting to stable and having, you know, the confidence of uh, not having the instability is pretty um, life-changing for that group. Does that answer your question? And Bobby, yes, one more. yes, it did. Uh, how much of TTTG can you correct using a trochleoplasty maximum? So this is, I suppose, where it's um, uh, it's a bit more difficult because my my approach, and I suppose it's a little bit like Jonathan Eldridge. I don't. I mean, we've done the paper together, Shri, as you know. I've, I've removed a lot of the TTTG stuff on it. Um, I'm, I look at the TTTG, but does it influence my decision making? The answer is no. Yeah. Professor Fulkerson, what's the maximum? <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble from the professor now. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about me. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, what's the question again? The maximum? What's the maximum you can, correction you can do using uh, tibial tubercle transfer? I've done some pretty extreme transfers uh, for fixed habitual lateral dislocators, dislo fixed lateral dislocation, uh, habitual dislocation. <clears throat> so I can't even tell you how far because in those patients, my goal is to mobilize the entire extensor mechanism and to get it centralized into the whatever trochlea they have, or at least balanced on the interior aspect of the knee so that they can have improved uh, functional capability. So. I mean, I would say, you know, I probably moved it. You know, I probably moved the tubercle, you know, two, two to two and a half centimeters in an extreme situation. So that would be a huge change in the TTTG. But somebody like that, I don't know what the TTTG would even mean because they wouldn't really have any kind of normal trochlea with a habitual dislocation anyway. So I think that probably goes beyond. I think TT, we just have to be careful with TTTG. I don't think we should hang our hat on it all the time. I think we just use it as an indicator, as I mentioned, like a flashing yellow light. So, oh yeah, that's, hmm, that's high. Yeah. There are studies that show that, you know, Miho Tanaka and uh, Diane Dom have shown independently that it's not that reliable. Um, it's helpful, but it's not reliable. You get different ob observers, give different measurements, you know, it depends on plane. I mean, there's a lot of interest now in how MRIs are done. You know, most of them are not done in an orthogonal plane. So what are we actually looking at? You know, I think we sometimes maybe maybe we fool ourselves a little bit. To, so, I mean, I think it's helpful, but I, I just don't think it's enough by itself to make a decision to do surgery on someone. Uh, question for uh, John. What do you think about um, trochlear length? Do you think that influences... Um, uh, well, I don't think it influences anyone's decision making at the moment. Do you think it affects outcomes? We've, we've got a little bit of early data that we presented at ISCOS last time on that, and we've been collecting a bit more. Um, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think that comes into the realm that I'm actually really interested in. And I would hasten to say that I don't really have any great answers for you. It's something that I hope by the end of 2021 that I'll have some answers because we're going to be doing a lot of 3D printing and studying things like that. Um, and I look at these models on my desk and uh, I'm not quite sure how to interpret it yet, but there's a lot of interest and in I think it's important. I think it's something we need to understand better what it means and uh, how we should address it. Currently, my thinking is more geared towards, you know, more and more towards getting the, as you meant, as I mentioned before, the patella to the trochlea and trying to understand the whole, uh, kinematic process and then trying to modulate that as best we can for optimal function. And the length is one of those factors. So yeah, thanks. I hope you keep looking at that. I'd like to know more about it. Thank you. Um, Professor John, we have one more question from the, what is the significance of assessing coincident femoral antiversion in these patients with patellar instability? Really important. Um, again, that's one of those things I should have 
probably said more about. Um, I just kind of breezed by that too much, but, but you know, by saying look at function, you know, I mean, if you look at the way the patient walks, I think it pertains greatly. I mean, if somebody has excessive antiversion and you see it functionally and they're internally rotating, I look at femoral antiversion. When I think of femoral antiversion, I think of acceleration of the trochlear rotation medially. Okay, so think about that. If you have more antiversion, what is happening typically is your femur is rotating more rapidly internally. So it's running away from the patella. Okay, I think that's what it means. So if one were to have a correction of femoral antiversion as Bob Taiji likes to do, um, you know, it would, it would slow that down. So it keeps the trochlea from rotating away from the patella as rapidly so the patella can get into the trochlea sooner. And uh, so it's a functional factor. It's one of those things that we, I don't think we measure enough or understand well enough. I tend to lump it by watching the patient walk and seeing how rapidly the femur internally rotates and it becomes part of my decision-making algorithm as far as what to do next. So sorry for its indirect answer, but that's honestly how I look at it. Um, again, I don't go so much by numbers. Uh, you know, there's not a certain amount of antiversion that I would refer somebody to have their femur derotated. Um, and I tend to be more of a compensatory surgeon at the knee to try to get the patella to the trochlea that they have given the antiversion they have. If they need to have the femur rotated for another reason functionally or whatever the reason might be, and they've got to have the other side done too, then that's a different story. Then I, you know, put that into the mix. But you know, th think about acceleration. I think that's uh, something we haven't really talked enough about. Okay, one last question for Dr. Bobby. Have you ever had to do a tibial tuberosity osteotomy along with the trochloroplasty? Yes, um, I've had a, I've had two cases in seven years where I've done a um, typical tibial tubercle transfer, trochloroplasty, and MPFL. And so I remember those cases very well. Uh, one was um, a postman um, who had lived with the most extreme dislocation I've ever seen. Um, well, not, not the most extreme, but extreme dislocation, how he coped with it for the years. He literally, every step he took, he had to bend over and put his kneecap back in as he walked. So, um, yeah, for that, that patient, he, he, I, I did all three. Um, and I have to say, I can't remember the details of the case, but, um, yeah, that, that was, that was a, very few indications I'd have for that, but they are very, very rare cases. Is that at the same sitting, single sitting? Yeah, or? yeah. So it's um, the, the, the approach you use, uh, use for that is tuberosity off. So you get nice access, do your trochloroplasty, then uh, fix your tuberosity, then everything is fixed, then do the MPFL at the end. Okay. Thank you, Edmund. That was very useful. So do we have any more questions? Dr. Srinivas? Hello, Dr. Srinivas. Okay. I think that was a wonderful session. We covered more of the complexities of uh, patellofemoral instability with respect to both uh, reconstruction, the new MQTFL, and also uh, tibial tuberosity transfer, both medialization and anteromedialization. That was a wonderful program. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to share your knowledge, Professor Fulkerson. Thank you very much. This is actually one of the best overall discussion. I mean, we've been at this for an hour and a half, and uh, it, it, I think you've all raised some really good points, and uh, enough so that I'm going to change my presentation, add a couple things that uh, need to be added. So thank you for that, and I uh, appreciate this wonderful discussion. Great questions. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. Nice to see you. Thank you, Dr. Bobby. It was, I mean, you thank made you. the distance, so thank you very much. Best wishes. And I think uh, I definitely have at least. Thank you. I'm sorry. At, sorry. at least three or four, four hypotheses on which we may have to work on. This is the take home message that I have from today's meeting. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of research to be done. And Dr. Sinivas is back. Yeah, my power is uh, uh, power went off actually. So <laughs> we all have a lot to learn. I'm working, on a, I'm working on a mobile uh, battery light. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, let me know if you have any, uh, you know, okay. ideas and things, any research. That, yeah, uh, that's the low for the discussion for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Was, uh, okay. Uh, Thank yeah. you very much. It was a wonderful program. We loved Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Best Thanks. wishes. Stay healthy. Stay, Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.